I please ask you to give a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker for this evening, Martin Ford QC. Hello, Manchester. Um, I clearly haven't got a northern accent, so you might think I'm any superficially black. <laughs> um, so many dignitaries here, I'm bound to get this wrong, but I think in order, the last speaker, who's the, the, the Mayor of Mayors, then I've also met uh, the Lord Mayor of, uh, of Manchester, who also said, call me Donna. Now, what, what northern warmth is that? You wouldn't get that in the south. Um, Councillor Donna uh, Ludford, um, Councillor Leanne Igbon, I've met uh, today, uh, I think, two Deputy Lieutenants, and I did ask um, a fellow guest, because I've never seen so many chains in one room, what's, what's, what's the collective noun for uh, uh, a group of mayors? And he said a chain gang, which I thought was quite, quite interesting. Um, anyway, I'm going to take a little while to just explain to you uh, a, a few things about my, my past and, and my, my family. And I was asked by Charles um, to honour the past and rally uh, us for the future, so I'll do my best to do that. As far as the past is concerned, I think I can do a little more than say a little bit about my, my own family. My father came here in 1953 from Barbados, and my mum came, having met him in St. Lucia, from St. Lucia 18 months later. He was a printer. He left school at 13 in Barbados. My mum was a primary school teacher at the age of 17, uh, but her qualifications weren't uh, recognised here. My brother and I came along in the 60s. My first day at school was on my fifth birthday, and I came out of school. And my mother asked me how it had gone, because she taught me to read before I went to school. And I said, Mum, they don't think I can read. So she marched me back into school, and she said to the teacher, any book, any page, any order. And I read, I was then in what you would call year one, up to year six. She kept going up the years, and I kept on reading. And that was my first sense of being different and not being accepted for the five-year-old that I was. That somehow I was going to be underestimated throughout life. I was going to be told that I couldn't achieve what my white peers could achieve. And because I had the parents I had, that made me more determined. So at the age of 10, having spent many a summer holiday watching Crown Court, I said I wanted to be a barrister. I told my class teachers this, and their, their attitude was, well, if your dad isn't a judge or your mum isn't a solicitor, there's no chance, because, you know, we're white teachers. How come, how's this little black boy going to become a barrister? So my career's advice, and I say this for the younger people in the room so you get some impression of where I've come from, was to go to the Ford factory in Langley, near Slough I was brought up, and work in the paint spraying department, because I was good at chemistry. That was my career's advice. Luckily for me, uh, I had a new headmaster at the age of 15, and I got good O-levels, and he said to me, because I wanted to be a cricketer at 16, um, I saw myself as a Malcolm Marshall, because I'm half Bayesian, half St. Lucian. I would actually have gone back to the Caribbean to qualify to play for the West Indies. I failed the Tebbit test with pride. I'd never have played for England. Um, and uh, he took me under his wing, and he encouraged me in my A-level studies, and eventually he then encouraged me to apply to Oxford, which nobody from my school had done. It's a state grammar school. I remember going for the interview. All these public school boys were trying to kind of psych me out. My dad had bought me a suit for the occasion. And uh, I just sat and took it all in and went into the interview. And they were very surprised because Martin Andrew Ford, born Farnham Common, Buckinghamshire, looks very white on paper. And this is before the internet. And this is before photographs. And they'd heard nothing about my school. And I just talked, which I've always been able to do. I'll try and keep to my time tonight. And I was offered a place. And that was the turning point. I never realized what a difference that would make to my life. And what I would encourage all of you to do, parents, grandparents, when your children are academically able, as so many of our children are, make them aim high. 
because far too many teachers lower the expectations of our bright and brilliant children. So when it comes to the rallying cry, I'm going to be saying, get organized. Because we need to support each other. Nobody else is going to do it for us apart from us. Yes, we have allies in people like the various mayors we have here. And I have to say, I've worked in Manchester a lot because I do a lot of general medical council work in the St. James building. Um, there is a warmth here that you don't see in the south and there is a sense of integration. And I do think that because people have had very hard lives out of London, that does unite you in a way in which it divides the south. One of the problems with the culture wars of the south compared with here, it seems to me, is that migration and immigration is a distraction. And it's a distraction because the idea of making people fight each other when they should be united and seeing divisions, even within the races, the Sikhs, the Muslims, the West Africans, the Caribbean people, this is a distraction. Because for those in power, we're just non-white. They don't say there's a Bayesian, there's a St. Lucian, there's a Trinidadian, but we do. They don't say there's a Ghanaian, there's a Nigerian, but we do. They don't say there's a Muslim, there's a Sikh, there's a Tamil, there's a Sri Lankan, but we do. And as long as we allow this to happen, they're winning because it's a distraction. And then what happens, of course, is that for the white working class, they're effectively told, these people are competing with you. They're competing for schools. They're competing for hospital places. In fact, we actually run the NHS. You see, see how, many, how many people of color died in COVID? You know, all the people who had frontline jobs that were, do, that were doing all the cleaning and, all, and, and the bed making and, and taking away the bed pans. But all those front work line works without PPE were people of color. And then at the other end of the scale, so many of our brilliant surgeons were also uh, from the, com the wider Commonwealth. This country cannot survive without migration. And it's about time the politicians stopped lying to the British public. We are net contributors to the economy of this country net contributors. By 2050, and I hope to be one of them, there will be more over 80-year-olds in this country than under eights. So who is going to be working, paying taxes, and looking after our aging population? We will need migration. In the same time period, the population of Nigeria would, would have doubled, and they'll be mostly under 25. So migration, if you have an aging population, as we've seen in places like Italy, um, is inevitable. And I praise the asylum seekers, the bravery. Nobody wants to leave their home by choice. My parents came for a better life, but they also made a contribution to this country. My family have paid about 150 years tax. The current legislation going through Parliament means that although I was born here, because I'm entitled to a Bayesian passport and a St. Lucian passport, as are my children, and in the case of my younger two, because their mother's half French, a French passport, we could all be deported without being told why. Because we have the option, like Shamima Begum, who in my view is disgustingly overseas, of, an, of another passport. So how insecure does that make me feel? So my personal plan, it used to be pretty, but she's now gone. So write to Suella, or maybe to Charles and say, you shouldn't give royal assent, now I'm king's counsel, to the fact that I could be deported, and say, if you give me the 145 years tax that my family have paid to this country, plus interest, I will buy an island of the Caribbean. <laughs> and I will happily leave. <laughs> So where do we stand now? Well, things still aren't good, are they? I don't know if you saw the State of Black Britain report that came out on Monday, but I would advise you to search for it. We still have major problems with discrimination. There's no glossing over them. 65% of black people said they've been discriminated against by the healthcare professionals because of their ethnicity. 60% said they've been passed over for promotion or employment due to their ethnicity. 59% said they or someone close to them had experienced stop and search or wrongful arrest. Now, pausing there, it's worse in London. 
In the first lockdown, 25% of young black men between the ages of 15 and 24 were stopped and searched. 80% of them, no further action was taken. 10% were cautioned, and 10% there was legal action taken. So 90% of people they stopped and searched for walking black, because that's what it comes down to, were innocent of any, either any crime or any major crime or, or significantly arrestable crime. I myself, on the 1st of August 1988, driving my Ford XR3i convertible cabriolet with great pride, was stopped six times in a day, because it was the 1st of August when the number plates changed. Car like this has been reported stolen, sir. And I said, for the fifth time, for the sixth time, if I'm not dressed like this and I walk around South London, no Met officer says he might be King's Council. He might be black and middle class. They have no concept of us achieving at the level that so many of us do. So what we have to do in terms of a rallying cry, it seems to me, is to network better. When the deportation flights first started, which unfortunately, and I know Andy's gone, was predominantly brought in by John Reed. I know um, Theresa May gets it in the neck for the hostile environment. But again, as an aside, the third reading of the hostile environment vote, Ed Miliband whipped the Labour Party into abstention. I think he was looking for the UKIP vote. And unfortunately, those parties we would think would naturally support us are very worried about being seen to be pro-immigration. I would quite like a Labour Party that says, we will win without your racist, ill-informed, bigoted vote, and to begin to stand up for us in terms of the legislation that's been passed. It is entirely wrong, in my view, that somebody who comes here from Jamaica, age three, can be deported age 33 as a foreign national offender. I'm not proud of that person, but they are British criminals and they should be treated as such, not sent to a land that they have no recollection of. And that brings me to Windrush. I could have been a victim of Windrush. In 75, my parents decided that we would go back to the Caribbean for the first time. My father applied for naturalization. At that stage, he'd been in this country for 22 years paying tax, and he'd done two years national service in the Air Force, but he still had to naturalize. He'd actually thought he'd come here on a British passport, which was the biggest con trick in the world, because he came as a citizen of the United Kingdom and colonies, which is separate and distinct. My parents had less status than the current Hong Kong Chinese have, because for some reason, we love the Hong Kong Chinese. Do you know there are up to six million of them that could waltz in here tomorrow? No, no migration issue with them. And I'm not meaning to set one group up against another. Look at the response of the Ukrainians compared to people of color. And again, I love the compassion that's been shown, but show us a little bit of that compassion too, please. Back to my parents. My father applied for naturalization. He got the following letter, which I found going through his things about a year ago. And I, I spoke to the select committee on Windrush about it. And it was chilling. Basically said, dear Mr. Ford, thank you for your application. In 1966, you became Barbadian again. That's 13 years after he'd been here paying tax. You need to go to the Barbados High Commission and get a Barbadian passport with your wife. Now, my mother was actually St. Lucian, so they didn't even know where she was from. Your boy's applications are in order, but until you've been put to your election, we're not going to process them. My brother and I were automatically entitled to British passports. Now, had my mother, because I remember my father kissing his teeth and throwing the letter on the table, not insisted that he reapply, I would have been a Windrusher. I wouldn't have had any status. I could have been deported, even though I was born here. There were people who were placed in care, in loco parentis, as the lawyers would say, of the local authority, with every aspect of their childhood policed by the courts, that because they had been born overseas, got to 18 and were told that they'd have to go back to a country that they were born in when they'd come over here as a babe in arms. It is truly despicable. The scheme has stagnated. I have been trying to speak to the Home Office about n numerous claims that have come to my attention, which are now three and a half years old. And whenever I speak to my moles in the Home Office, they say, Martin, it's all Ukraine. 
I'd like the Labour Party to pledge to granting legal aid to every Windrush compensation applicant, because that's the only way that the claims will be properly formulated, and frankly, we've paid enough tax to justify legal aid. I don't see, you know, and we've paid council tax. In my borough of Lambeth, every household got a letter welcoming EC nationals and making sure that they had applied for their settlement status with a dedicated telephone line and a walk-in centre in the town hall and battle buses. We, we got the go-home buses. The EC uh, got the battle buses. I wrote to Lambeth and said, where's the, where's the Windrush compensation letter? You have a massive Jamaican population in Brixton. Been there since the 50s when they marched from the Labour Exchange to the Labour Exchange from Clapham South Underground, which is where they were housed, underground like rats, to the Labour Market, to Labour Exchange, where white bosses go, I'll have you, I'll have you, I'll have you, what's your skill, what's your skill, what's your skill? And yet nothing like the publicity has taken place around Windrush. £43 million has been dedicated by this government to the Hong Kong charities to assist the Hong Kong Chinese to come here. That's 86 times what's been given to the black community to promote the Windrush compensation scheme. So I don't want to end on a down note because it is Black History Month after all. As Lizzo would say, I channel my inner Lizzo. It's about damn time. But it's black history year, it's black history decade. We have a rich history in this country and it's not taught. There's a wonderful book by a woman called uh, Kaufman who, it's called black, black Tudors. Did you know that the highest paid courtier for Henry VIII was a black man, the trumpeter, who named his price? Did you know that when the Mary Rose sank and white Europeans couldn't swim, they went to Africa to find pearl divers to salvage his cannon, which were worth the equivalent of 1.3 million pounds each. So Henry wanted them back. And those black men came here in the middle 1500s on contracts with a percentage of salvage as free men. Some went back to Africa with their spoils, some stayed here. There's been a black free presence in this country since the second century. None of this is taught to our children. None of the, we hear about the Egyptians and pyramids because they're not as black as us, so they're allowed to be clever. We don't hear about the Etruscans. We don't hear about the wonderful female mathematicians who did all the serious mathematics for the Apollo uh, missions. I don't know if any of you have watched Hidden Figures where they were made to run to the toilet across the car park whilst doing all the complicated mathematical calculations. We are taught that Edison invented the light bulb. No, he didn't, because he had a paper filament. It was a black man who had the tungsten filament. So our really rich and varied past and contribution is completely undervalued. I've always said that if on my first day at school, as the first black child to go to my primary school, the teacher had stood up at the front of the class and said, this is Martin. His mummy and daddy have come to rebuild our country we should say thank you to Martin and his parents. My life experience would have been completely different in terms of the appalling racism that I experienced growing up. It made me resilient. and I always had my parents to depend upon, but no child should go through that. Yesterday, I met in conference uh, Raheem Bailey. Raheem Bailey is the 11-year-old boy who was chased by Welsh thugs at his school and trying to escape, he lost one of his fingers, caught on a fence, because he had a ring on that finger. And he came, he's now, they fled from Wales to Luton, and he came into chambers to see me, and I've got 12-year-old twins, and I've got two older children. And I thought, right, how am I gonna explain what I do? So I said, I'm gonna argue your case. I'm your barrister, I'm your mouthpiece. His face lit up. I brought my wig and my gown, and I think somebody's put it on social media. Um, let him try it on. And I thought, if that boy thinks that there's the potential for him to achieve what I've achieved, this has been a good day's work. I, s I 
I spoke to one of my white counterparts at a similar level who shall remain nameless, and I told him that I had this lovely afternoon with Raheem, took him to McDonald's afterwards. I said, do you want to go to Middle Temple Hall with its double hammer beam ceiling and, you know, going back to the 1800s with lots of impressive paintings, or do you want to go to McDonald's? McDonald's, he said. <laughs> um, I said, oh, I've just done this conference. And he said, well, loss of a finger, that's not worth very much. Is, is that really worthy of a silk? I said, that's not the point. I didn't care how much the case was worth. I didn't care how much I was going to be paid. I wanted that little boy to know that people like me existed. And the reason I've come here to talk to you is because I want you to know, with both for yourselves and your children, that it's possible. And actually, it's also possible around social mobility. Because I came from not very much. My father left school at 13, as I've told you already. He was pretty strict. It was, if I got 98, why didn't you get 100? Um, eight sixes before he said hello. And I got no credit or praise really for anything. Pride in his grandchildren like you would not believe. <laughs> I stood outside Senate House in Cambridge two days after my father's 85th birthday. And I said to him, Dad, when you left school in Barbados, age 13, did you ever think you'd live to see the day when having seen your eldest granddaughter graduate from Oxford, because my daughter had theology there, on your 80th birthday, you'd be about to see your eldest grandson graduate from Cambridge two days after your 85th birthday? I think that's quite a story. You know what he said to me? It skips a generation. <laughs> so, friends, allies, wonderful city, wonderful warm people, sense of integration, sense of unity, massive support for the asylum seekers. How can anybody not grant those lovely women asylum? They're an asset to your community. Stick together, keep working hard together, network, call on people's time, call on the time of people like me. You know, if you've got legal problems, we need a network of lawyers, we need a network of doctors. You know, we need a, a, network, a, a network of estate agents. You know, we need to stop being dependent upon the people that want to pull us down. And as I said, that's as much about social mobility. It's much, it's much a white working class problem as it is for black people because we're all treated the same. And all they want to do is divide us, constantly divide us. And we've got to make sure it doesn't work anymore because it's a distraction. Because whilst they're getting their bankers bonuses and filling up their pockets and, and profiting out of PPE, we're all suffering. Not me, of course. You know, I'm, I can't pretend I'm a poor man, but I've worked hard to get there. But I haven't forgotten where I've come from, and I never will.